Welcome to the Tough Girl Podcast, a three-time award-winning show that aims to inspire and motivate you while increasing the amount of female role models in the media. We showcase the stories of incredible women who are making a difference in the world of adventure, exploration, and physical challenges. I'm your host, Sarah Williams, and I'm thrilled to have you here. If you're passionate about adventure, challenge, and learning from women who have overcome obstacles and achieved remarkable things, then this is the podcast for you. Every week, we bring you new episodes featuring incredible women who share their stories, insights, and tips to inspire and motivate you in tackling your own personal challenges. And the best part? By supporting the Tough Girl mission on Patreon, you're not just helping to keep the show going, you're joining a community of people who believe in the power of female role models to inspire and empower others. Your support helps us continue to bring you high quality content and promote the stories of amazing women around the world. Visit Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com forward slash Tough Girl podcast to become a patron. New episodes every Tuesday at 7am UK time with occasional bonus episodes on a Thursday. Thank you for listening and for being a part of the Tough Girl community. Let's get started. My name's Paula Craig. I'll be 60 in July and I'm currently based just outside Watford. I was a police officer for 30 years. I retired in 2017. Now I'm working again for a company and we're currently being employed by the Home Office. I do, I do enjoy my sport. So it's mainly mainly swimming now. Of course, what I didn't mention was that I was paralysed having been hit by a car 22 years ago. So, you know, I do a lot of swimming now. And I think if I hadn't learned to swim as a child, I mean, I wouldn't say it's impossible once you're injured, but it would have been a lot harder, I'm sure. Did you have any siblings growing up? Yes, I'm the youngest of four, actually. So I have an older sister and two older brothers. Oh, and did you always want to grow up to be a police officer? No, I didn't. I didn't know what I wanted to do. And in fact, before I joined the police, I was a radiographer. So I came to London. I was saying came to London. I'm, I'm not far from London now. So I came from Pembrokeshire, a fish guard right on the coast, to London at 18 to be a radiographer. And then it was only a two-year training. It's three years now, but it was a diploma then. So I trained for two years, qualified, worked for another two years at St. Thomas's in London, St. Thomas's Hospital. And then I walked over Westminster Bridge one day straight to the careers office and joined the police. Oh, my goodness. So what age did you join the police? 22 years old. Yes. What was it like back then? I think if I had come to London at 18 to join, it would have just been too much, to be honest, because, you know, I didn't I didn't know London. I mean, to come from quite a small town to somewhere like London was quite overwhelming in itself. But I think having lived there, you know, for or lived this way for sort of four years, then I was I was ready to do that then. Or I felt I, I don't know. Are we ever ready? But um, I felt I felt ready to take it on at that point. What was the draw or what was the reason who in sort of inspired you or? You know, I don't have none of my family are in the police. It's something that I'd sort of thought about when I was growing up. But then, you know, it kind of, in fact, I, I actually remember saying to my brother one time, oh, I think I'll join the police. And he said, oh, you'll get beaten up. Which was, and, I, and I just thought, oh, well, I won't join the police. And that was it. In fact, when I was at St. Thomas's Hospital, it was the sort of the police hospital, so to speak. And for instance, during the riots in, in 85, those people that had been injured that were not police officers got taken to one hospital and all the police officers came to St. Thomas's. So I think just, you know, seeing the commitment, I guess, and, and you know, the officers that had been, you know, some quite badly injured, but just sort of absolutely keen to get back out and, and straight back out to it, you know. And I think just, yeah, it just really, you know, really inspired me, I think. What was it like being a woman in the police force? Um, I loved it. There was fewer women. I mean, there was there was still quite a lot of us, but certainly fewer than there are today. And to be honest, I I mean, I loved every day of my career. I don't recognise, you know, maybe fortunately, I don't recognise the situation within the Met Police now because I just loved every day. And in fact, when I just before I was injured, I spent five years on the National Crime Squad. And I was the only woman on the team. And and actually, that was quite useful because quite often on surveillance, you have to go into restaurants, for instance. And of course, they'd often put in a couple. So I just seemed to get free meals quite a lot, which was, <laughs> which was really good, actually. <laughs> I was also running at the time because I, I ran the, Mar- the London Marathon six years running. And actually, five of those was when I was on the national. So, yeah, it was in the days when I could eat as much as I liked and not have to worry about it either. So that, that worked really well for me. Yeah. So what was your running journey? How did you get into marathon running? I mean, I ran a little bit school, but, you know, just 400 metres, 800 metres. I've never been 
a, a short, short distance runner. I don't think I have a, a fast twitch fiber in my body. So I've always been an endurance athlete. And I think, well, certainly when I came up to London, I suddenly put a load of weight on because it had, you know, there was never much of me. And I came up and suddenly put all this weight on. And, you know, I was still 18 and it, it took me, you know, I, I mean, I, I can't diet. So it was about six years later when I was still trying to sort of shed the excess weight. And I actually just thought, oh, I might, I'll just start running. And then, oh, I literally would run sort of lamppost to lamppost, you know, quite often the way people start. I'd have a rest, walk up to a lamppost, run, and it went on like that. And then eventually, I mean, it worked for a start with losing weight. So that encouraged me to do a bit more. And then I started, I think, entering some races. And I don't even know at what point, because I must have just run over the years at that point, because I know I was hoping to do the London Marathon for the first time when I was 30, I should say. But I can't remember why. Maybe it was an injury. So I did my first one in 1995 when I was 31. And then I was just fortunate, I think, because... I realized that actually my, my first one was three hours, 23. So, you know, I thought then, oh, this is, you know, this is quite a good time. And then I, I started running for St. Albans Striders. Then once I started running for them, I then ended up being in the team. So in those days you go with the fast ladies because the teams went with the fast ladies. So I think I did 323, then 321. And then I think I did 317. And then I dropped down to 304. And of course, once you do... I'm not actually sure if this is the way it is now, but if you do sub 315 as a woman, you were automatically in the elite start then. So I did, yeah, I think I did two at 304. Um, My fifth one was 302. I was just chipping away, chipping away. And then finally, finally in 2000, I managed to do two hours 57. So, yeah, that was that, you know, that was such a, a fantastic thing to achieve. And I have to say that I was injured the following year in 2001 and I think the fact that I'd achieved that you know it it really helped me I know it sounds maybe strange but it really helped me deal with you know or helped me come to terms with my accident because I think if I'd been injured when I was still on 302 (laughs) I would have forever thought no I really wanted to break that three hours on on legs not on wheels you know I've done it since on, on wheels but I really want to break that through our barrier. So, yeah, have, you know, having done that, that was sort of under my belt, so to speak. That is rapid running. <laughs> like, congratulations. Like, thank you. Oh, like the time dropped from three hours 23, 321, 317, and then 304, and 302, and then, oh, yeah. What's happening mentally, especially when you're trying, you know, you're trying to go from 302 to, you know, to sub three? Yes. Like during the race, you know, could, can you remember your thought process, like what was going through your head? Well, certainly on that, on my last one, as it turned out to be, I trained for it. You know, I tried training on a, with a um, heart rate monitor. I tried oh, all sorts of different ways. And then I just decided, I thought, you know what, to run sub three, you've got to average, I think I've got to, have to average 650 a mile, six minutes, 50 a mile. And so I decided that what's going to do was, and it sounds the most boring thing to most people, but it worked for me. I used to get on the treadmill. So anything under about 12 miles, I used to run at six minutes, 40. You know, I'd set the treadmill to run at 640. And then anything over 12, I'd run at 650. And so I just felt if I got used to running at that pace, and that was my normal pace, then obviously when that was on the, when I was on the road, that I would be able to you know, I knew what it felt like to run at that pace. If I'd run at 6.50, it would have got me just under. But on the day, I think it was something like 6.47. And bizarre, I mean, I have to say, you know, when I was running then, they used to actually call me one gear Glenda because I seemed to have one pace. I just needed to get that one pace up. I, I've never been able to like shoot off. I wasn't, I wasn't particularly quick at 10K. In fact, my 10K time, if you put it into a, you know, you get these, tables in runner's world for instance and i think when i looked up for just just under 40 minutes for 10k it said you know you would do a three and a half hour marathon you know i could never run off fast and i didn't fade at the end so actually when i did my sub three it was really interesting when i got the split times through because i did the first half in 128 28 so i was almost smack on the same for both halves of the london marathon which i know the really good runners will, will do that they'd train for it but I, I just didn't train for it that's just the one pace I had but I could just keep going you know that that's how that worked for me so I think when I went on the start line you know I was fairly confident you know I thought if it, the day is a good day and I don't get any niggly injuries then if my plan comes together I thought I'll do it and, and yeah luckily I did when was the point that you realized 
I'm going to do this? Or was, was it not until you crossed the finish line, you were like, oh, I've done this? I think probably coming along the embankment closer to the mall, you know, because you can work out, you think I've only got one point, you know, however many miles left to go. And I knew I felt strong. You know, I mean, I, I wouldn't have had much to go for another five, for instance. You know, I did feel strong because I trained properly. I think this is the big thing for the marathon. And I'm always fascinated when I see people on the television that get stopped by these, you know, the commentators at maybe 16 miles. And they say, oh, fantastic. You know, and I've I've only ever run 16 before. You know, this is great. And I just think oh, it's, it's about to get not very great at all. Because if you've only done 16 in training, 10 more is just, you know, it's huge. But I, you know, I had trained, I've run three lots of 20 miles, you know, I was confident. And then as I say, when I got to, I don't know, maybe one or two miles out and I was, I knew what I was averaging. Yeah. I mean, I knew I was going to do it. So I just really enjoyed. And of course the, the benefit of going on the elite start, which was just an amazing thing to be allowed to do, was that, you know, the crowds weren't there, as as in the, the spectator crowds were there, but the crowds of runners weren't there. So you could just run as best you could. And the support, I mean, the crowd would carry you. The crowd certainly carry you in at that point. It's just incredible. Life did change for you pretty drastically. Mm. When did you start getting back into swimming or moving your body mm. you know what did that journey look like for you because once I had achieved the sub three to be honest at that point I thought well oh you know to improve again you're talking I was running six days a week you know you're talking about running twice a day and I never you know I never set out to be a runner I just set out to lose weight so I didn't particularly want to try and be you know run twice a day or anything like that so I decided that I would start doing triathlon instead and in 2001 in the mart so that I was out training on my bike and I got hit by an elderly gentleman who didn't have his glasses on so he hit the bike uh, and I obviously came off and I think I went over his bonnet and sort of off the side of his car and as a result my vertebrae my 11th and 12th thoracic vertebrae were dislocated which damaged my spinal cord and left me paralyzed from the waist down and then I, I mean I, I remember it you know I do remember the accident I don't it doesn't upset me thinking about it, it doesn't upset me talking about it but you know I do remember it and I I got taken to the Royal National Orthopaedic Hospital which was just you know to be fair the best thing that could have happened because they've got incredible facilities there for people with spinal cord injury and I got there and you know my two the two major concerns were you know whether I'd get back to being in the police and whether I'd get back to my sport I learned quite early on that I was going to be able to go in the police which again was you know was fantastic because they weren't obliged to take me back I wasn't injured on duty so they could have actually said you know that I couldn't go back but they didn't sport wise as a sports person you know you don't get sympathy from other other you know friends which is great really I'm not I don't really do sympathy very well so you know it was a case of oh no problem you know you could do the marathon as a wheelchair user you can do this you can do that and so quite quickly I decided that I was going to do the marathon again as a wheelchair athlete and in fact go back to doing triathlon so to begin with, I didn't know obviously how, what exactly that would entail. Obviously, the swimming, I can't use my legs. The cycling, it's a hand cycle and the race chair, which, you know, everybody or not everybody, many people will, will know from the London Marathon, the wheelchair athletes. So at Aspire, they have a pool which has complete wheelchair access. So you there's a ramp that goes down and you transfer onto a plastic chair and just go into the waters. So in the accident, I also tore my left triceps or partially detached my left triceps so my hand they sewed it back but my left hand was clawed my fingers were completely clawed and I didn't know if I would have the use of my left arm which was you know my biggest worry to be honest at the time I knew about my paralysis that was you know say it was fine but I'd accepted that but obviously not knowing if you're going to have one you know useful arm and so six weeks after my accident they took the plaster off my left arm I asked them if I could swim and they I had to do like a I think a little test in like the hydrotherapy pool and then I actually went into the swimming pool and it was a bit strange because what I've forgotten of course is that I only had one working limb as such so I was then <laughs> just kind of going around in circles really but you know that feeling of being in the water was just absolutely amazing and actually they'd give me all sorts of occupational therapy to try and get my hand to work and nothing seemed to do it and then when I started swimming and pulling my hand through the water that really is what got my hand back as well. So now I have full use of my left hand and, you know, that all seems fine. So, yeah, that was the swimming side of it. So I got back to swimming and I would go take myself off from the ward and go swimming. And then 
a guy who's now a friend of mine who works at the the charity Aspire is based there, which is why I do, I do a lot of my fundraising for Aspire now. And they're based there. And one of the guys that works there came to see me actually through, you know, through the grapevine. And he came to see me with his race chair and showed me the race chair. So it's like, OK, I'm going to do, yeah, I'll do, you know, I can do the race chair. And then I, you know, I researched the bikes and I bought myself a bike while I was still in hospital, actually. So, yeah, by the time I left hospital five months later, I was pretty much kitted out with what I needed. I didn't have a race chair because I needed to try one and you know, obviously make sure I, you know, I was going to enjoy it before I ordered the made to measure and they're, they're all very expensive of course as everything is so I just needed to make sure that you know I really was going to enjoy it but I came out of hospital after five months I think uh, well my first London marathon then was 11 months later in 2002 and then I also did my first triathlon in 2002 as well so yeah I was back. How was it moving back home did you need to adapt anything for you in your living space or oh. what happened there? Oh, Sarah, I had to sell everything. I mean, it's, oh. that's probably one of the, I mean, I lived on my own and it's, I was in a two up, two down house and I drove a manual car and, you know, I drive an automatic now because I use hand controls. You know, I obviously can't use my feet at all. So you use hand controls. So it has to be an automatic and I could never get back in my house. So in that time in hospital, it, it's a, yeah, it's a very strange thing because not only was I selling my house, but you know, you're asking somebody else to go in and pack all your things, which is a bit it's not something you choose to do to say to somebody else, Would you please pack my house up? So when I came out of hospital, to, I had no house, I had no car. Well, I did have a car because actually I picked it up the day after I got out of hospital with the hand controls with a or a new car, an automatic, but I had no house. And I actually went back to my parents in Wales briefly. But I, again, you know, Aspire came to my rescue because they have interim accommodations, which are properties in various places around the UK that people who are ready to leave hospital but can't go back to their own homes or have nowhere to go for whatever reason, you know, as a result of their accident, obviously, they can provide short term accommodation until you're in a position to get your own place. And I was compensated, obviously, because I got hit. So, you know, a year later, I, I moved into my own home again, but I, I spent that year in a property yeah, that Aspire provided. It sounds as though you just accepted it. There's like, there's no bitterness, there's no regret, which is amazing. And I love mm. it. But I always find that like s- surprising just how quickly you accepted it. Like, why do you think that was? I honestly don't know. I think people, I mean, obviously some people don't accept it. And it's you know, it's really sad because it's, you know, so it's, it's a long well, I don't know. I always say, you know, a day's a long, a long time to be miserable, really. You know, I mean, if you're sort of bitter, but that's not, you know, that was not me deliberately saying, oh, so therefore I'm not going to be bitter. I just felt, I mean, to be honest, at the time, the man that hit me, as I understood it, was going to see his wife who was in a home. And so I, you know, I just felt, well, you know, he obviously felt he needed to do that. I mean, it transpired that he wasn't in any way regretful whatsoever and told people it was very inconvenient that he had to get a taxi. So uh, I kind of lost a, you know, at that point, I wasn't quite so sympathetic. However, I think I just focused on the future. And also I was in hospital with two ladies, both of whom had fallen down the stairs. It was interesting because they would say to me, you know, oh, I can't believe you're not bitter. You know, somebody did that to you. And but I remember thinking, well, actually, yeah, somebody did it to me, so I can't blame myself in any way. But if I'd fallen down the stairs, would I, you know, would I blame myself for falling down the stairs? So I think sometimes our minds, they just work for us. You know, they help us. They kind of adapt us, <laughs> to adapt us to think in a way that causes us the least pain, maybe. I don't know. Yeah. So you said um, five months later, you'd left the hospital. Eleven months later, you're on the start line of the London Marathon, but this yeah. time in a wheelchair. And so- yeah. What was that experience like, being in the wheelchair, being on the start? You know, what was the energy like? What was that race like? I love the London Marathon. I think I would, I would encourage everybody to give it a go. And you know what? If you're slow, even better, you can just enjoy the atmosphere for longer. You know, that's the thing. It's such a brilliant day. So to be back on the start line, just to sort of realised, I suppose, that I've achieved something. You know, 11 months later, here I am. I'm back. I'm doing, th- you know, doing something I love. And it was. I mean, I was, you know, there was only like, in fact, it was quite funny because, when I was in the police, I was also, or before my accident in the police, I was also an undercover officer. When I finished the race and I was, there was three of us and I was third. So obviously I was last. And, um, but it came up, it comes up the television first, second, third. So of course my name came up the television, but I didn't go on the podium because rightly there is a minus one rule. And because, you know, obviously they're not going to put all three of you up. There's only three, but of course 
afterwards, my my friends, you know, didn't want to accept that I was last. So, of course, you know, when I was saying I wasn't up, they said, no, it's because, no, you were an undercover officer. You couldn't go on the telly. And I kept saying, no, no, it's because I was last. It's like, no, no. <laughs> so obviously nobody wanted to, you know, to sort of take that side of the story that I was actually last, but I was last. But, but there was three of us. I thoroughly enjoyed it. I did get asked at the end by a, a radio station. They said to me, you know, apparently you're the first woman to run it and then push it. And then I said, well, yeah, apparently I am, at which point the reporter asked me if I would encourage other people to do that, which I, I didn't think that was a bit of a strange oh. question because there's obviously not many people that particularly have run it and then are paralysed. So it's not something that you can really encourage, is it? But, yeah, it was yeah, it was just really nice to be back taking part regardless of, you know, in, in what capacity, I suppose. With swimming, do your legs just like hang down in the water or will they float up? That's a really interesting question. That's good because when I started, because obviously, uh, you know, as a runner, I had no, well, I I had very little upper body strength, you know. So uh, when I started swimming, I wasn't a particularly strong swimmer, not without my legs, because, you know, obviously I used to kick like mad probably when I was able bodied. And so my legs did used to sort of fall a little bit. So believe it or not, I used to get a kiddie's armband, inflate it, put it, on one of my ankles, then strap my two ankles together so that my legs would stay on the top of the water. And that's how I used to swim. I mean, you couldn't miss me in the pool. You know, they'd just see this one kid's arm band going along behind me. But then as I got, you know, a little bit stronger and a little bit faster, now my legs, yeah, they just basically drag along. But they're not particularly low, to be fair, now. They, you know, they just, they do drag along behind me. I I, I never know where they are because, I, you know, I have no sort of concept of where they are in the water until... I see some footage and it's like, oh, right, okay. <laughs> so, so I sort of snake a bit, really, because as I, you know, obviously I can't use my lower half. So as I sort of reach forward one arm, you know, my body goes that way. So my legs sort of snake behind me as I swim. Can you control like your stomach muscles and your core muscles? Yes, I can. And again, so that's the thing. When I was in hospital, and I, I say this so often, but it's so true that every other person on that ward was worse off than I was. I'm sure that they would have all given anything to have had my injury. So, you know, nobody wants to be paralyzed, but my level of injury means I've got no use of my legs, my buttocks, bladder bowel paralysis, but I have all my stomach muscles. So I can use my stomach muscles where what happens is for each vertebrae, you have 12 thoracic vertebrae. So my T sort of 11, 12 is affected. Each one up, so 10, 9, 8, with each vertebrae, you lose a little bit more. So, you know, you start to lose, you know, your stomach muscles and then it goes up your diaphragm and then actually it goes up. So your number one thoracic, then you're going to see your cervical vertebrae, you've got seven. And again, as each of those gets affected, you lose, you know, your, your arms. You have people saying about maybe a T4 and they're paralyzed from the sort of the chest down, just below nipple level on a man, so to speak, you know. So, and then, of course, as you get higher, some people need assistance with breathing. T12, really, uh, you know, somebody said to me once, it's a flesh wound, you know, <laughs> in, the, in, the, in a spinal injury world. I wasn't fortunate of the accident, but I was very fortunate that that was the level that I was injured from. So I have all my core strength. With your swimming, you took on the English Channel doing a relay channel swim. Yes. Do you want to share more about that challenge, how it came about, why you decided to take it on? I did three London marathons in the wheelchair and I think I did three triathlon world championships and then unfortunately I had a bone infection with it was on my buttock it was an abscess possibly caused by transferring into the race chair and as a result of that and I couldn't feel it it spread to the bone it got to the point where my skin they had to cut down onto my left buttock and that skin was like really vulnerable and it's just the way that you use the race chair where you come up down up, and that friction I was just worried that that was going to go again and of course when I'm off with any sort of pressure sore or, or broken skin as such, then I can't go to work. And I loved my work and, you know, I really loved it. And I didn't want to be off sick. I didn't. So I thought, you know, I'm really not going to be able to do the race chair anymore, the triathlons. So I started swimming and I think my first challenge and I swam across from the Solent to the Isle of Wight. And I think that was about, I can't remember what that is, how far that is, about an hour and a half anyway. And then I did a five kilometre swim Then I think in 2019, I did the dart, the river dart, 10 kilometers to swim. And then, of course, we had COVID. But I go along every year and Aspire put on the Relay Channel swim. So what they do is they advertise for people who want to swim the channel, who are not, maybe don't want to or can't swim the whole thing, certainly me, but and, and maybe don't have 
you know, five bonkers friends who want to swim it with them. So then they can come along and they will be put into teams of six to swim the channel. And you have to raise £1,750. Quite a lot, it's obviously a lot of money to raise. And it's quite easy. It's quite tempting. You know, you, you reach a target and think, right, I've done it. I've done it. I've done it. So, of course, what we'd like is that quite a lot of that money goes actually to fund the boat and to fund all, all the other bits of just doing the channel. So every year I would go along and speak to the swimmers and sort of tell them my story and how a spy helped me in the hope that they would just try and raise more money, really. And I have to be honest, every year they used to say to me, and when are you going to do it? And I say, I'm not, I'm not going to do it. You know, and this went on. And then I went along in 20, 2020, it must have been. And I actually had another bone infection. You know, the hospitals weren't taking, taking people in. It was still the whole COVID thing. So when they asked me in, in 2020, I confidently said, I'll do it next year for my 20th anniversary of my accident, thinking, well, I won't because obviously I'll, you know, I'll still be waiting for my operation. And then what happened was I got taken into hospital with sepsis as a result of the bone infection and consequently spent three months in hospital. I came out of hospital on the 1st of March with no bone infection, no sepsis, and more importantly, no excuse not to do the channel. <laughs> So I'd had bed rest for three months. They think for every day on bed rest, it takes you three to recover sort of thing. So <laughs> potentially had nine months to get back to full fitness. But actually, I only had a matter of probably four or five months or something like that before I was supposed to be swimming the channel. Aspired to training weekend. So the first one was in May and we went down. It was 10.5 degrees in the sea and it's non-wet. Of course, the big thing about me doing this was that I wanted to do it by the channel rules, which is no wetsuit. Um, I didn't realize when I said I would do it that I was going to I was going to attempt to be the first person with a complete spinal cord injury to do it by the rules. So the first time we went into the water, it was 10.5. We had to swim, I think, 20 minutes out for an hour and then back in for 20 minutes. And that's the hardest thing is getting back in. So, you know, you, you, you've been freezing cold, you get in, you've just finally warmed up and they say, okay, you're going back in in five and you just want to cry and say, I don't want to get dressed again, but going back in then for 20 minutes. And then in the June, I had to do a qualifier and the qualifier is, uh, this is set by the Channel Swimming Federation. The qualifier is 90 minutes in the water and it has to be sub 16 degrees and you have to swim for 90 minutes then you come out for 90 minutes and then you go back in for another hour so you know when I look back I don't know I mean I was frozen I was frozen I was swimming and I thought right it must nearly be 90 minutes because I am so cold I think it was 15 point oh I can't remember now exactly what it was I think it was just over 15 degrees and I looked at my watch and it was 22 minutes into the swim. And I just wanted to cry. And I honestly, to this day, I have no idea how I kept going. I genuinely accept that I was part of a team. And, and, and actually, I picked my own team. I was very fortunate to be able to say, right, I, you know, I want my, you know, my friends who I swim with to, to be in my team. And I just think, you know, they just got me through that 90 minutes somehow. I just do not know. And we were told before we went in, they said, you know, if you do the 90, don't worry, there is no way that you will not go back in and do the hour. And it, they were so right because it was so hard to do that 90 that you just think, I never, ever want to do that again. And I knew if I didn't go back in and do the hour, then I would have to do that qualifier, you know, because I still hadn't qualified, you know, it had, you had to do the second swim. So I got in and I did my my second swim and that was it. We were qualified. And then, so we just trained and trained and did various events. We had another training weekend where we did a night swim. And then we were due to go on, the, I think it was the 10th of August. So we we went to Dover. I remember being in, in the shop buying a bottles of water to take on the boat. And I was literally in the queue. And we were briefing at 8.30 p.m. We were, we were setting off at 10 at night. And my WhatsApp went off from our boat leader. You have a boat leader. It just said, it's cancelled. The weather's changed. <laughs> I hadn't even booked a hotel because I was going to be on the boat all night. So I've driven three hours down and obviously we went and met the boat leader and we went and spoke to the pilot of the boat and we totally accepted his reasons. It's his decision at the end of the day. That's the thing. And then I had to get back in the car and drive back again. It was absolutely devastating. I mean, genuinely devastating because then you go into a queue because you only have a seven day window. So if you don't go in that seven days, the following week, you have all the teams that are then set you know, that's their week. And unless they all get across, 
then they don't then go into the list of people who are still waiting, you know, and then offer you another date. The rules on the channel swim is you each have to swim an hour. And once you go and once each of you swim, you have to maintain that order. So on that swim, I actually went in fourth. So I would have then, you know, I would have had to go in again on my fourth, you know, when it came to my turn, I couldn't then say, oh, I don't feel well, I'll go fifth. You know, you have to do it. That was all very precise. Ultimately, we got the chance to go on the 10th of October. It was a big decision because obviously it's a lot colder. The nights are a lot longer, which obviously affects the temperature. You know, you're getting out. But we said, no, we'll give it a go. And so we gave it a go. And I actually got into the water. I think it was at 20 to 4 in the morning. I plunged into the pitch black water and it was cold. It was very cold. And I swam for an hour had a bit of a nightmare because my hat rose off. So I lost my hat. Oh, it was just anyway. But I did my hour and I got back on the boat and our fifth swimmer did her hour. But unfortunately, when our sixth swimmer was in and was actually swimming, the pilot said, no, the weather's turning and we have to go back again. All devastated. You know, we, we gave it our best. But of course, that was it. We knew, we, you know, we were not going to get another opportunity in 2021. And it was just devastating because, you know, we'd raised an awful lot of money and, you know, I know nobody would be sort of uh, blaming us all, but, you know, you do feel that responsibility as well for, you know, all these sort of generous people donating. So it was another, and then of course it's another year of training. So kind of had a bit of a break and then started training again. Fortunately, I didn't have any skin problems this time. So I was able to train quite well for it. And then eventually on the 4th of August last year, we set off, we set off about midnight. So some of our swimmers swam in the dark, but I was the sixth swimmer. So when I went in, actually it was light. The problem I had was you leave the marina in Dover on your boat and then the boat takes you around to Samphire Ho because that's where you have to start. And your first swimmer then swims to shore. They have to clear the water and then they sound the horn and that's it, you're off. So our first swimmer, Katie, swam to shore. Well, before we'd even got round to Samphire Ho, I was being sick. I started being seasick before we'd even started. And I never stopped being seasick, either being sick or just lying too frightened to sit up because I would be sick. When it came to my turn after five hours and or, you know, about 20 to five, they're like, you've got to get ready. You've got to get ready. Yeah, I was stripping off and I'm being sick as I'm trying to get my clothes off. I'm actually, I've actually got a video of me on the edge of the boat. We had a boat with a sort of gate at the back because most people come up the ladder, which I obviously couldn't do. So I'm sitting on the edge of this boat with my sick bucket and I'm actually still throwing up as I'm on the edge of the boat being counted into the water. <laughs> Having said that, when I plunged in, actually, that was the first time I felt anywhere near normal on the whole trip so far. So actually being in the water was just fantastic. So I swam, I did my hour. And I almost didn't want to get back on the boat, you know, because it's like, oh, no, here it goes. But I swam for the hour and it was, you know, it was fine. It was quite choppy. So, I, yeah, I managed to say by the boat, I did my first hour. And then I'd practiced using a, we actually used a spinal board to get me back on the boat. So they would put that into the water sort of vertically. I swam, because you're not allowed any assistance. So I then swam up to the board. I mean, obviously, they, they had to then lift the board, but they couldn't sort of lift, you know, really lift me, which potentially would have injured me anyway. So I swam up to the board. And then once I got hold of the Kevlar straps and sort of pulled myself against it, they were then able to lift the board up. And then as soon as it was sort of over the lip of the boat, just tip it and sort of slide me in. So came out the water after my hour and the girls really just dressed me because, you know, I was cold, but it's just really difficult as well. I mean, on the team, there was three, three men, three women on the team. The girls dressed me and then I just lay back down being sick again for the next five hours. <laughs> <laughs> I just lay in the in sort of just inside the boat in this little cubby hole with my sick bucket in my hot water bottle and I couldn't eat. I tried to drink coffee and then every time and the boat leader bless her was desperately trying to get me to eat because obviously I needed energy. But I mean, honestly, I could not keep anything down. And I mean, even like actually gave me a small bunch of grapes. They didn't last long, I'm afraid. There was just nothing that I didn't see again. And so I just in the end just sip sip coffee. Eventually, it was five hours later and it was my turn to go again. And I remember because I, I sat up and I started being sick again. And one of the girls said to me, Paul, you don't have to do this. You don't have to do it. I said, you're joking me. <laughs> like, <laughs> I am doing oh, this. I am doing this. <laughs> exactly. And, and actually, I think I was quite looking forward to just getting in and like being in the water again. So I got in then again. And actually, to be honest, all I was thinking was, 
Paula, this is it. You know, this is when you get out this time, that's it done. You know, you, you've just spent, you know, the best part of two years training for this. Enjoy it because, you know, you want, there isn't another swim. We're close now. You know, we're, we're three hours, including my swim. Just kept thinking, oh, enjoy it. Enjoy it. So I, I just really, really enjoyed the second swim. You know, the others are on the boat and they're all encouraging you because you can see them clearly then in the daytime when I got put, brought back in after my second swim that was it for me and it was like great so that was te- that was you know 12 hours in and then it turned out we just had two of our swimmers did another hour and then we were so close in the end that we weren't sure if Marco our fifth swimmer would uh, sorry he was the second swimmer of course but he was would land us but again they're so precise that they had to swap with three minutes to go so the third swimmer Simon went in and had to swim behind Marco. And then when they sounded the horn, he had to then overtake and just do the last three minutes to the shore. But by this time, obviously we're docked just off the beach. And while everybody else was celebrating, I mean, I was celebrating in my head, but sadly I was just cuddled up with my bucket, you know, <laughs> thinking I've got another three hours on this boat now to get back again. And of course there was, it was like another three hour journey back while I lay in my cubby hole watching the others drink the champagne that I'd brought. So that was quite nice to see them celebrated <laughs> while I, while I watched on feeling dreadful. You'd be pleased to know that within 20 minutes of being back in Dover on land, I felt as right as rain. I was back to talking as much as I always do. And, you know, we headed straight to the pizza restaurant and ate and ate and ate. I mean, massive congratulations. Um, Thank you. (laughs) Paula, where are you most active on social media? Where's the best place for people to find more information out about you, find more information out about Aspire? Where should they go? I actually have an Instagram account, Paula Craig 37 and I'm more than happy for anybody if they want to get in touch to DM me. I'm not very active, they'll say, I think, but I will get back in touch eventually when I when I do read the messages. So I apologize in advance if, if I take a while to answer, but um, by all means, you know, do contact me. Aspire have the website, aspire.org, I believe it is. But if you just Google Aspire and there's, you know, there's heaps of information on there. Fantastic. Yeah. So that's Aspire supporting people with spinal injury. I'll make sure that I put the links to their website and to your Instagram account as well. Paula, I'd love for you to share your final words of wisdom, final words of advice for other women out there who are looking to take on a new challenge. Apart from just do it, what advice would you like to share? And you can take that in any direction that you'd like. Well, I actually have a a picture in my kitchen and it says life is not about waiting for the storm to pass. It's about learning to dance in the rain. You know, that's something that really struck me because sometimes, you know, we wait for things to get better and we just, you know, we sort of plod along until things get better. And sometimes they may not, like in my case, they when I say they weren't going to get better, obviously, you know, I was going to improve, but I wasn't, there wasn't going to be a time when I wasn't paralyzed anymore. So for me, it was about learning to really embrace everything I could do in my now situation, you know. So I think for anybody you know, change is, is we, we're just so resistant to change sometimes as well. And my change was forced on me to some extent. And I think when you just look and see what that change can bring you and the benefits, you know, it can bring you, then you just get huge satisfaction from it. And I think taking on challenges for me is probably more about the satisfaction I get. So, you know, whether that is dragging myself out of bed half five in the morning or the ultimate goal of swimming the channel. It didn't really matter because all of those little steps along the way made me feel better about myself. You know, everything you do, I think, and achieve that you maybe thought you couldn't achieve or even, you know, just put off the day, you know, things that you just think, oh, I'll do it tomorrow, I'll do it tomorrow. and then you think, oh, I'm going to do it today. And I think we all then think, oh, I've done it, I've done it. That's fantastic. Just those little things every day that, you know, you'd just be able to go to bed at night, look back and think, I did that today and that was a good day. And yeah, for me, it's, I'm not saying I never have a bad day, but my bad days are never in relation to my accident. It might be something that happened. And, and most of my days are, the, the vast majority of my days are very good days. Paula, thank you so much for coming on Talk Our Podcast and sharing more about your journey and your challenges and massive congratulations for swimming the English Channel. Just an incredible achievement. Thank you. And thank you so much for having me on. I really appreciate it. Hey, 
Hey Tribe, I really hope you enjoyed that episode with Paula Craig. What an absolute inspiration. Everything that we have talked about today will be available in the show notes at toughgirlchallenges.com. So please do go and visit the website. If you've been inspired by the Tough Girl podcast, if it has changed your life in some way, if it has motivated you to sign up for a new race, a new challenge, go on a new adventure, then please consider paying it forward. And one of the ways that you can do that is signing up as a patron. If you visit patreon.com, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com forward slash Tough Girl podcast, there is an annual option and there are monthly options that you can con- contribute at depending on where you are in the world patreon should have your currency available they do all the major currencies euro sterling us dollar singapore dollar australian british pound etc but they also do other currencies as well so please do go and check that out your financial support really does make a massive difference and it does allow me to continue to grow the podcast and to invest in the mission to increase the amount of female role models in the media while motivating and inspiring you I'd like to share that the next episode we are going to be speaking with lisa thompson she is a novice climber and breast cancer survivor and she shares more about how she went on to summit mount everest and k2 she's just really her new book finding elevation fear and courage on the world's most dangerous mountains a little bit more about the episode and what you can expect in a world where mountain climbing is still considered a male dominated activity lisa thompson is a force to be reckoned with the second american woman to summit k2 lisa has overcome countless obstacles in her journey to become one of the world's top mountaineers from her early days of hiking and climbing in the pacific northwest to leading all women expeditions in nepal lisa's determination and perseverance have been the keys to her success. Lisa's journey has not been without challenges, including a breast cancer diagnosis in 2015. However, she refused to let this setback define her and instead used it as motivation to pursue her passion even more passionately. She founded Alpine Athletics, a training company that helps aspiring climbers reach their mountain goals and has since led expeditions to some of the world's highest peaks. In her recently released book, Finding Elevation, Fear and Courage on the World's Most Dangerous Mountain, Lisa shares her personal journey of climbing K2 and the lessons she's learned along the way. Her story is a testament to the power of perseverance, determination and self-belief and is sure to inspire anyone who is looking to take on their own personal challenges. Don't miss out on new episodes of the Tough Girl podcast going live every Tuesday at 7am at UK time. By hitting the subscribe button, you'll get access to inspiring stories of women, sharing stories of adventure and challenges and providing top tips and motivation for you. All that's left for me to say is wherever you are, whatever you are doing, give it your all. Give it 110%. Get after it. Go for it. Believe in yourself because I believe in you. Take care. Lots of love and I'll speak to you soon. Bye. Bye.